thank you very much for the invitation. Um, thank you very much for the you know uh, opportunity to share um, sort of the development of the, the process that we've been going through to um, update and um, and discuss the top 2025 guidelines. Um, I'm going to be going over a little bit of the history and um, activities we've been up to over the past several years, um, and then I'll be going into more details about that process in particular. And um, yeah, let me sort of get started. Uh, I'd like to begin every talk with just a, a note of disclosure about uh, the Center for Open Science. We are a mission-driven nonprofit, and our mission is to improve trust and credibility of empirical scientific research through um, a series of activities, through studying the barriers to transparency, uh, building tools to enable open science practices, um, and training and advocating for policies and practices to make them possible. We are generously uh, supported by both public and private foundations, and all of our funding information is available on our website there. All right, uh, as an overview of what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to start with a little bit of a background of what the transparency and openness promotion guidelines are and their, their history and how they've been used. I'll be giving some information about the governance of the advisory board that oversees and um, uh, provides guidance for what these policies should include. I'll be giving examples of how we use, how we have used TOP to compare and improve policy across many different disciplines. I'll be pointing a little bit about TOP in the literature, both how it's been evaluated and how um, uh, various studies have used it to compare open science policies across the different disciplines and landscapes. And what I'm most excited to talk about uh, is putting out areas where um, there's room for improvement in how the TOP guidelines are currently structured and what we've done to um, hopefully in improve them and um, I won't uh, reiterate this too much, but just in a couple of weeks, we'll be um, posting more information about this. It's been about a two-year process to update and revise the top guidelines, um, and uh, the advisory board is still putting some final touches on what the preprint will look like that will be posted um, by the end of the month, um, and that will come out with more um, blog, more, more announcements about the details of that. Um, but none of that is um, uh, under wraps, so to speak. So I'll be I'll be going into as many details as I uh, am able to right here. And I encourage and welcome questions. Um, probably as we get towards the end, will be an opportunity for the best questions. So the top guidelines, the Transparency and Openness Promotion Guidelines, were published in, in 2015, and they are a policy framework that's designed to be agnostic to specific disciplines. Um, I, I will note, and I think it's pretty clear that a lot of the um, uh, uh, early efforts around the top guidelines were from the social sciences and the psychological sciences in particular, um, but a lot of the characteristics of the top guidelines were um, designed to be uh, applicable to many types of em empirical research, and some improvements are uh, coming down the pipeline to help further that uh, increasingly. They're designed to be modular in order to um, have broad applicability so that uh, methods of research or disciplines of uh, that that use different methodologies can pick and choose the type of practices and policies that are most relevant to them. And a key feature is that they're tiered in order to start at a level that is one step above the, the current status quo. A lot of that is just encouragement for open science practices, which we know is not very effective. So it starts above that with the disclosure requirements. And then from there, it goes to more mandates and more verification processes, which are can be more and more problematic or, or require more and more effort to implement because it takes more effort to do that. Um, but all of TOP is designed to be one step above the status quo. And again, the revisions that I'll be talking about are designed to actually um, make sure that that is true across all of the open scholarship practices that are included in, in top. So this is a, um, 
uh, an oversimplification, and I'll be pointing out some of the uh, discrepancies in the current top guidelines and what we're doing to improve that. But uh, for the moment right now, just take this at face value. The top guidelines consist of open science um, practices that uh, can be applied or ignored by various different entities, however they wish. And it starts with a disclosure requirement, then it is a mandate to do something, and then there's a verification step. And just to give two um, general types of examples of what we tend to see across some different disciplines, um, political science and economics have been conducting computational reproducibility checks, that verification step that requires code and data. They've been doing that um, for 15, 20 years now, several of them. Um, and they've been leading the way in that. Uh, but, but they don't necessarily require uh, materials being shared. And so we see more disclosure requirements around those. Psychological science has been uh, promoting the use of uh, study registration, pre-registration more and more. Uh, they've been conducting more replication studies in, in the past uh, several years, um, but there can be you know, big problems with sharing data openly because of the use of human subjects data. So those can be applied at lower levels. And that's just an overly generalized example of that modular and tiered structure that top uh, uh, proposes. The top advisory board is governed by the advisory board members who uh, provide recommendations from across many different fields. Um, some of them are from the um, publishing industry, some of them are from the life sciences. Uh, we have several folks with uh, clinical research backgrounds, and the purpose of the advisory board is to bring in expertise from across um, different disciplines in order to um, help address that issue that I mentioned right at the beginning to broaden the focus outside of the of the social sciences in particular, while still being, of course, relevant to that. Last year, the top advisory board um, approved a new government structure. And so this uh, dictates how advisory board members will be um, voted in and what uh, requirements are needed to change the governance structure. And so all of that is openly available on our website. And I encourage folks to take a look at that or use it if you want to create your own advisory board. It's it's a useful resource just to, to see. And, um, and it's available publicly. Uh, we're in the second round of soliciting um, new board members. And so this process is, a, is an annual process where three-year membership is uh, begun with a third of the membership at any one time. And that is of course designed to have a, you know, a, a rotating list of individuals bringing in expertise, having a few years to provide that input and then um, refresh the board on a continual basis so that there is, um, so that there are new ideas that, that um, come in uh, on a on a regular basis. So, um, if if you miss the current round of um, nominations, there'll be another one coming up at the beginning of next year. One activity we've been uh, conducting and and spending a lot of time on in the past several years is comparing policies across several different disciplines and how they um, compare to the framework provided by the top guidelines. Um, and, and that data set I'll be talking about in just a moment is a rich data set of um, policies. And we've been monitoring change policies that have occurred um, over the past four years. So I'll, I'll be describing that data set and a couple of different ways to, to use it. And I would encourage everyone on the call or listening to this recording to take a look at that data set and to um, use it. It's, it's um, licensed in the public domain for infinite reuse. So that project is under the big banner called the Top Factor. Top Factor is an evaluation of journal policies as they relate to that top guidelines framework I mentioned several times. It is, of course, three points for a policy that inquires that verification step, that level three of the top guidelines. And of course, 
two points for a, a data policy that requires open data or one point for a disclosure requirement, such as a data availability statement. And across those um, policies, the, that maximum score is actually 29 um, at the moment because of a, uh, you know, a funny little uh, specific way about how we uh, count disclosures and, and, and open science badges. Um, we'll likely be winding down the uh, addition of, of new journals into the top factor database at the end of the year. Um, but we've got about 3,200 journal policies evaluated on that and are continually um, rescoring journals that were put in over the past four years to monitor how the landscape um, is, is changing and how effective um, efforts like this are at encouraging uh, policy change. And so I'll be showing a little bit of that data right now. Um, and again, it'd be uh, fantastic for more folks to take a look at that um, and to um, answer questions based on how effective efforts like this are at improving policy change. Just to get a, a few summary statistics, uh, my colleague Ella is on the call and she does this uh, summary report every month. Uh, so I greatly appreciate that, but just giving a general distribution of how many policies exist at uh, different levels of top factor. Um, so you can see the, the the largest bin is the top factors around a uh, level of one to five. Um, we, we personally think that level uh, top factors of six or above are journals that are taking sort of credible steps to include several verifications or strong encouragements to do various open science policies. And then there's, uh, you know, several dozen journals that are taking extra steps around um, uh, many of these um, open science policies. So digging into that, um, all that information is, is publicly available on our dashboard. Likewise, we monitor the changed policies, as I mentioned, um, that we come across every month. And every month we see um, you know, a small number, uh, most typically less than a dozen. Um, sometimes when a publisher makes a policy change, we see a few hundred at once. Uh, but we see the number of journals and the number of individual, individual policies changed. Um, and we make that data available on our website as well uh, in order to again, monitor the landscape um, and to try to start to answer questions about how um, effective policy changes are from the federal government level, for example. There have been a lot of efforts um, from the, the U.S. federal government to um, mandate more data sharing and other, other open science practices. And so efforts like that are perhaps being reflected in the changed policies that we come across in the publisher level. As I mentioned, these data sets are available um, on the OSF. And so, um, and these slides will be available so you can get those links directly if you'd like. Um, but the, the raw data behind top factor is available. So is the data that indicates every, um, every changed policy we come across uh, we, we put into the spreadsheet showing the, the journal, the, um, the data at which we noticed it being changed and uh, what the policy change was. So going from a level zero to a level one, for example, that is noted. The top has been used um, over the past 10 years in the literature um, hundreds of times. And I'm going to highlight uh, two different types of uh, evaluations and uh, landscape analysis that we've uh, come across. And, you know, uh, the purpose of this is also to encourage more of this type of um, evaluation and, and scholarship using the top framework. Um, the first type of uh, use of top that we see in the literature is is simply the kind of the same way we use it, but just at a more granular level. So um, scholars have taken a look at um, how policies are being applied within specific fields or disciplines. Um, uh, this one, of course, in, in sports and exercise science, uh, a group of colleagues were monitoring the degree to which open data or replication or study registration policies were being um, implemented um, from one field to the next. And uh, we, after conducting those studies, 
um, we go back a, a year or two later to see what policies have been changed or not um, after these types of um, efforts have taken place. And sometimes we see change policies more often than not, we, we do not. And so we, we also encourage other ways to advocate for these. There's also um, some scholarship that's ongoing on exploring how TOP is implemented or, or why it is not implemented at, at various levels. And so surveys of journal editors asking um, you know, what their opinions are about these efforts and, and how difficult it might be to implement or, or not. And a lot of it comes down to the, the sticky question of compliance, putting out an open science policy um, without the resources of, of the time or personnel to monitor compliance is something that is um, a frequently cited barrier to adopting additional open science policies. Um, several members of the top advisory board were instrumental in this particular study, um, evaluating the top guidelines um, and comparing how journal policies are evaluated themselves. Um, a lot of journal policies are written um, by multiple people over multiple periods of time. Sometimes it's journal editors and publishers working together um, or not working together. And so you see inconsist uh, inconsistent language throughout different parts of the author guidelines or, or the article submission process, et cetera. Um, and so, um, Sean Grant and Evan Mayo Wilson uh, uh, evaluated a lot of this, um, a lot of those inconsistencies in journal policies and the barriers to simply understanding what the requirement is of the journal. So, as I mentioned at the really beginning, 2015 is when top top guidelines were initially published, um, and over the past um, uh, ten years, uh, approximately, uh, we've gotten feedback at different points of time. Um, and as we've gone into more and more detail, evaluating more and more journals, we see areas for um, improvement and, and um, making sure that they are as clear and, and as useful and as universal as possible. Um, so I'll be going over some of that um, right now. So as I mentioned, the the ideal, the, the sort of the uh, the summary of what we talk about top is this uh, eight different journal policies that can be applied at one, two, or three levels of increasing rigor, disclose, require, verify. But when you really dig into it um, for a variety of reasons, um, that that's an oversimplification or um, this right here is, is not correct. And here's where it, it actually um, is listed. So data citation and design and analysis or, or the use of reporting guidelines. Um, read critically, it really just encourages the use of these types of practices. Um, and that's something that we don't want to see in top. Um, for materials transparency, that whole um, computational reproducibility verification step, um, it isn't well defined. And what I mean by that is that computational reproducibility requires using original data, using original code, and seeing if you can generate those findings that the authors are showing in their summary figures and, and, and results. But there isn't really a, um, that the use of what a research material is in that process is um, not well defined. For the use of study pre-registration, requirement and verification steps are flipped. And that was for a good reason. The The reason that occurred is because lots of journals are um, willing to take the time to see if the study registration matches the, the final reported manuscript or to provide guidance on how to do that to their reviewers. But they're not necessarily um, able or, or willing to, to say that only registered work um, can be published in this journal. And so that is appropriately seen as a higher level of um, challenge or, or, or a larger barrier to policy implementation to take that step. So for that reason, those policies were, um, that did not fit the typical 
level two or level three requirement. For data citation and, and, and design and analysis transparency, I, we put verify there in quotes because it's just kind of a, an enforced mandate. So it kind of states that it's an enforced level two, which is a little bit of an um, oddity. And then finally, replication is, um, it is perfectly unique to these three levels. Um, level one, as it currently states, encourages the submission of replication studies. Level two is a results blind peer review process. And level three is a registered report process where the proposed study is peer reviewed before it's actually conducted. And that's um, perfectly unique to that standard. So for all of these reasons, we wanted to make the top guidelines as um, as easy to understand and as useful as possible. And so these types of inconsistencies were one motivation for updating top. Um, and, and we came to several other, um, we came to several other conclusions throughout this process that led to additional um, policies being added or discussed throughout it. So I'll, I'll be going over those right now. Um, as we were discussing this, there were some discipline specific uh, uh, issues that became sticking points. Uh, different fields call the practice of study registration or pre-registration different. Um, there was distinctions between the, the purpose of top to, in, 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 to make change across the whole field versus focusing on the empirical claims presented on an individual paper. Um, of course, inconsistent levels that I just mentioned, um, and disagreements about the magnitude of problems from one field to another. So these were some of the sticking points that uh, arose over the revision process. And um, a couple of others resulted, and, and now I'll be sort of talking about what were the solutions to those problems that I've mentioned and some of the sticking points that we um, encountered over the past two years. Um, one of the solutions is to separate out uh, individual research practices that could feasibly occur in any given empirical research process. So um, an example of, of, a, of, a, of a program would be something that uh, has to include multiple um, players or, or multiple uh, uh, papers, essentially. So replication can't occur, of course, until there's an original research study. You can't uh, self-replicate before the empirical finding is discovered for the first time. So that's a, a field-wide um, program to be encouraged, but it's not an individual research practice. An individual research practice is the act of registering a study or sharing data or hosting a protocol, which is a new um, practice for top 2025. We propose new um, rows for the individual um, framework. So I mentioned protocols, removing a um, couple of out of date rows, such as data citation, which is going to be integrated into the requirement to, to do any given research practice. And then we revise definitions for how each of these should be implemented. So disclose is still the same. Um, the, the middle level, level two of being a, a requirement. Well, in fact, each of the top policies are a requirement to do something, even if it's just disclosure. And so providing more, um, so, so calling that something else will articulate exactly what it means to um, share and cite being that level two now. We also wanted to solve some underlying problems about what is and is not part of the top guidelines. And so we solidified a, a conceptual framework to help shape what we were doing with the top guidelines for top 2025 and to help provide guidance for future improvements um, that may occur in future years. Um, and so we, we um, were coming down to a definition of open scholarship practices and programs and those are activities or policies that have a goal of increasing the verifiability of an empirical uh, research claim 
Um, and so that will help decide, you know, what practices belong as part of the top guidelines framework um, and what policies or practices are better left to other players in the field that are making great strides towards um, improving science in other ways. So future proposals um, will be considered under this principle. Uh, so without further ado, <laughs> the top 25, 2025 practices, uh, this is the general framework for the first part of top 2025. These are the open scholarship practices. And I'll go through a couple of these. Study registration is of course the act of declaring that a study is about to take place and we're working with our infrastructure team to um, create uh, uh, pre-registration templates that um, articulate what are the minimal requirements needed to specify a unique study is about to take place. Um, so that's uh, also uh, a working group that our infrastructure team has developed um, and meets with on a regular basis to help answer that question and top being um, aligned with that definition will help clarify um, what the minimum requirements are for a study to be registered and trying to make that um, in compliance with um, clinical registration standards, the World Health Organization standards, for example. Protocols are a new um, addition to the top 2025 framework. So these are, of course, the, the um, recipe, if you will, for how a study is going to take place. Sometimes those are included in a study registration. Um, more often than not, they are not included in the study registration. So there'll be guidance for how to do that and how to do that well, um, and um, included in the different levels, there'll be a, a note about when the protocol uh, needs to be created or, or how updates to the protocol need to be disclosed. An analysis plan, um, many fields include um, a pre-analysis plan. Uh, of course, that is um, often included in a study registration, but like protocols, not always. We also encountered a lot of discipline distinctions between some disciplines really consider these two items the same thing. Some disciplines um, use a term, but have never used the other term. Um, and so there are still um, discipline specific tensions um, in particular with, with these two terms and, and when they are um, used and, and what they're used for. Data and materials are essentially staying the same as is code. And then finally, the use of reporting guidelines um, originally called design and analysis transparency you know, getting towards that goal of design analysis transparency, but it is the, the use of a, a reporting guideline or a reporting checklist, such as all of those that are available on the Equator network. So those were the top um, open scholarship practices. Um, and, and now we'll have a series of, of programs that rely on several different open scholarship practices and that also solve um, bigger problems than, than any one open science practice can um, solved by itself. Uh, comprehensive reporting is making sure that all of the work is being reported uh, as fully as possible, essentially to ensure that um, cherry picking of results or biased reporting of only the most exciting report uh, results is minimized. This can be done through um, what I mentioned earlier, registered reports where the whole study plan is submitted to a journal at once, and it, the final results are published once the authors follow through with that proposed plan. It can also be done with a series of disconnected steps where the study registration is compared to the final results, um, and, the, and, the, and the protocol and or analysis plan are also included in that package. Computational reproducibility. Um, again, that used to be one of the levels of of the top guidelines. It's now being pulled out as a specific program because, as I mentioned also for comp comprehensive reporting, it requires the use of multiple um, practices. So you know, uh, at, at the very minimum, 
data and code are needed to assess computational reproducibility. And it's a third party verification process, just not the authors is the key. Um, and, and finally, we've got a number of different initiatives that bring a, another um, roadmap for in improving how the process of science is, is conducted. Um, so there are different ways to ensure that the replicability of empirical research findings are as uh, comprehensive as possible. Um, uh, robustness checking and generalizability can take the form of um, multiverse analyses or many analyst types of projects. So these are um, not the core part of top 2025, but these are just examples of how um, universities, publishers, funders, um, and academic societies can work together to solve um, complex problems using the practices and using the programs that I just mentioned that are part of the top 2025 framework. Next steps uh, over the next six months, uh, we'll be rolling this out uh, to an increasingly larger audience. Um, so in the next month, we'll be posting the preprint, hopefully in the next two weeks or so. Um, all the details that I've discussed will, will be will be mentioned in that. Um, but of course, a little bit more detail will be included on, on, on each of the practices and the justifications for um, how different revisions were made. During that process, uh, we'll be engaging editors, publishers, and other users of the top framework. We have a managed feedback process once that is uh, posted to in incorporate um, changes that could occur to top 2025 or changes that should occur in future iterations of top. During the fall, we'll also be revising implementation guidance. What I mean by that are examples of author guidelines, um, best practices for article submission portals, um, and example disclosure statements of all the top 2025 practices. In January, once 2025 begins, is when top 2025 <laughs> will be uh, kind of uh, the new version of top, and we won't have to call it top 2025, we'll just call it top at that point. Um, and ongoing from that point forward, we'll be sort of collecting feedback for future improvement um, and, and hopefully ensuring that uh, the steps we've gone through over the past two or three years um, can be reiterated um, as efficiently as possible so that it won't be another 10 years until uh, the next version of TOP comes out, that that'll be more of a uh, biannual process, for example, or every two-year process. At this point, I think uh, I am just about done with my prepared comments, um, but I'm very happy to talk about any of the um, policies or any of the practices or any of the history or any of the future that um, is under the, the top guidelines framework. And with that, I think I'll probably stop sharing my screen and open it up to more questions and comments.